First of all, it's a small group of us coming along and uh, I'll tell you what, this, this has been part of the funny journey and where this day came about, I'll start from there and then it, because there's a small group of us is brilliant because we can kind of make it flexible, we can move around, we can have an informal discussion. So thank you very much by the way, Zach has been stepping up to do a talks, little talks for us as well. Um, in true, true fashion, this day was designed as motivation, mindset, inspiration, passion. When I put this up first uh, everywhere to say, do we want to do this day? There was lots of yeses, lots of yeses, which is why I decided to go ahead thinking it's different. With so many clinical courses everywhere, this will be a nice, nice, different nuance that everyone will enjoy. And it's funny how we ended up where speakers kind of went, oh, I'm not sure I can make it now. It's like, right, the theme is motivation, mindset, inspiration. Let me test Drew's motivation um, and let me test everyone else's. So I'd, I'd like to thank everyone because uh, I did send a message out to all the speakers and said, look, this is the situation we're in. And it was nice that we still carried on. So there was motivation. There was a mindset. There is some inspiration and passion behind what we're doing today because it's a small group and we're still carrying on. Um, and always, you know, was it good things come in small packages, so we'll enjoy that. Um, and we've got a good plethora of speakers to, to kind of work through the day. And I'm hoping as the day goes on, it'll really form a theme. What happened is, um, some of you may have heard that talk I did on failures. Some of you may not have heard it. It is recording live, whichever it was, about a year and a half ago. Um, but it, it kind of made me really start thinking hard about who is a tubulite? What is happening here? Well, you know, we were, dentinal tubules is an organization. Dentinal tubules is what it is, and we offer what it is. And there's a fixed price point for it, which is the, the 250 quid a year as an individual member. But very interestingly, we had a group of people who were sort of telling us, true, what you're charging is very low. You need to up the price. It needs to be 750, 1,000 pounds a year, whatever it was. And there's another group of people here going, why are you so expensive? You're eight times more expensive. Now this is the same thing sitting here. And one group was looking at it and going, it's too cheap. And one group was looking at it and going, it's too expensive. And I thought, this is weird. This is very strange. Why is this happening overall? And it kind of got me into a whole different work thinking. I started thinking and looking into the characteristics of these two groups of people. And I created seven personalities, people who were frustrated with dentistry, people who were bored with dentistry, people who were kind of doing dentistry, but the bureaucracy had put them off or something. And then people who were interested and people who were passionate, almost creating a scale. And I put this out to this group here saying, where are you on this scale? And it was seven points. These people said, I'm about six or seven, which is either I'm very passionate or at least I'm extremely interested in what I'm doing. And um, where were you before, before you go into the tubules ecosystem? Some of them were there and that's why they found it. Some of them were right down here. They were either frustrated, they were bored, they were anxious and it had moved them across. And suddenly that made me think, that's why they value this system because this thing in the middle isn't just a box ticking for them. It is about finding their true passion. It's about finding what drives them and motivates them and gets them going. Um, so over two years, I've been reading some really, really interesting stuff. And what came out most out of it, in fact, it's, it's in the bag I brought today, is this um, book. And I kind of put it there. But this book is just phenomenal. And I, I, if anybody wants a real, real read that puts you to sleep very quickly, um, but if you're awake, it takes you in that. Now, this guy, um, Robert Valeran, started this, um, uh, this, this, this work about 15 or 20 years ago. So it's a fairly new uh, science. And he started talking about passion, the psychology of passion, especially the passion at work. And what does this? Now, why I say this book can put you to sleep if you're not really into it is because it is genuinely a book that delves into papers and papers and research and science about passion and people. 
Where does passion fit into leadership? Where does passion fit into work? Where does passion fit into daily life? Everything like that. And more, what I loved the most about this is they really delve into depths of psychology, into the depths of uh, why people are seen as they're seen. One of the big things that came out of that for me was it's not just passion, because passion is, is, is really cool. But um, what really came out for me in that was to understand that passionate people are driven by intrinsically being motivated. They do things because they genuinely and intensely love it. And because they genuinely and intensely love it, they will invest the time, the money, the effort, whatever it is. They just don't seem to look at or understand what the financial consequences will be. What they look at is what will be the other outcomes that they look at. And finance may be one of them, but the overall outcome of this. Now, all day long, we work ourselves, we work with our teams, we work with everybody. And we, we may be really passionate there, but how do we spread this? This energy, this fire everywhere around would be very useful because that then creates that motivation for people. This then led me into the direction of behavioral science and I started reading PhD papers and thesis about these sort of factors and things along that. It then led me to reading other books and other information. There is another really cool author and she's on Facebook posting. Her name's Loretta Brunig and she started with a book called The Science of Positivity. So forget positive words, but the science, what triggers this information? And now she talks about hap uh, you know, habits of a happy brain and everything else. Really, really interesting to see how it all works. That then led me on to bits of neuroscience, and that's where I am now. And I'm loving that aspect, right, of neuroscience. It's apparently everything starts from up here and how it works. There's um, another author called Angela Duckworth who talks about grit and persistence, and that's another good book to read, uh, which is about why certain people are persistent, why they do it. Now, this I'm giving you all this because reading all this, I started forming some kind of a matrix, some kind of a drawing, to think what drives people, what motivates them, what pushes them along. And ultimately, I think that is the knowledge, the science, the energy we are now bringing into tubules with everything we do. It's about not just CPD, it's not just education. It's really motivating people, inspiring them so that they intensely love what they do. Now, I, I'm going to use a board because I, I don't input, but you know what I found out when somebody is is absolutely passionate about what they do. Um, there are certain very specific characteristics or things they end up with because they intensely love this stuff. You can see that, okay, I would hope, everybody um, along there. So if genuinely you're intensely passionate about what you do, and our team have had this before, these are people who interestingly have very, very specific values and principles. And they actually really know what they stand for, quite clearly, which is very interesting to note because that is part of their anchor. But not only do they have these values and principles of what they stand for, but they know where they're going. It's probably taken me the last 10 years to discover who I am, my values, my principles. And I can kind of relate back to going back to my younger days, and I kind of relay this on a personal level, I was a bullied kid at school. I was literally bullied, right? It doesn't sound right. Um, but I, I was, at that point, I was probably a learning geek and people to pick piss out of me and I had, didn't have the wit to respond back. Those same friends don't try to do that now, but that's a different story. And then I had my sister's story as well, where she was usually put down by a lot of people as well. But what I realized through those teenage years is I, became the person who not only had to make me believe in my own self, that don't worry about these you know, noises around you, you can do it, you can achieve it, but I had to do that same for my sister. And I realized through the years, I've been helping people personally to try and be the best of themselves, to believe in themselves. And it almost becomes now 
that people come along to me and go, you're so inspiring. And I think, I don't know what I'm doing to inspire people. I don't know. But actually, internally, it became part of me that I like to lift people up, motivate. So I suddenly started realizing my values and principles. And that's where I kind of now ended up realizing that I can set a proper goal to get 2 billion people tubulized in the next 10 years. And by tubulized, I want them inspired to discover their true passion because that's what it works. But interestingly, as a result of that, I figured out that the second thing passionate people have is some kind of a goal, some kind of a mental, you know, when we talk goals, some of us have written goals. In the next 10 years, I'm going to do this, I'm going to run the marathon, whatever. But actually, most of the people, passionately, are people who have mental visions of where they want to go. They've never written these down as goals. How many times do you all daydream, right? And how many times do you stay in certain places where you actually are really good at daydreaming and without realizing you're visioning yourself somewhere or doing something and you just get this uplifted emotion and you think, wow, those, those wow moments, moments that you get, right? That's actually your mental vision goals coming up. But we never jot these down. We never think about these things. We never pay attention to them. That is actually already your own internal mind telling you where you're headed. It's very, very cool to realize that, but not. About, I mean, f I think five years ago, I was at the, at the Grove, sitting with Jem, having coffee, and I jokingly said to Jem, I think one day we'll have a conference here. And I was kind of thinking, wow, would it be brilliant doing this, doing that, you remember. Two years later, we had the first Tubules Conference at the Grove. That was my vision and goal. I never just wrote it down. And when it happened, I thought, this is actually happening because there was a passion built in there. Interestingly, the third um, thing that happens is because they know their value and goals, these people start investing in learning about whatever their passion is. These are the same people who start finding the, com the same people, the same level of thought process. It's, and these people, because they are passionate about what they do, and you'll find this, you find a passionate person, you touch the right pressure point, and it's like you've opened up a hose pipe of chat. Right? This person is ready to tell you all about it, whatever they're passionate about. Right? I call it leadership, but it's these people, the leadership of... Let me take you in the direction of what I love. Let me take you in the direction of what I really enjoy and do, right? What you love doing is helping people raise the finance for companies to grow to the next level. And if I, whatever happens, if I sit you down for a few moments and I get you in your zone, you'll start talking about it without realizing it. That's your passion. And ultimately, like you're doing with your funding focus event, what you're ending up doing is leadership. And the leadership isn't you standing on top and saying, I'm going to do this. It's just you dragging people in that vision direction. That's ultimately what it is. You're conveying, these are my values, my principles. This is my vision. This is where I want to go. But what does that form? That, what does that form? When, when you breathe it, when you live it, when you talk about it, what does that form? It forms your identity. Because you form an identity about something. Because it's just changed the way you live, the way you think, the way you've been through. It's completely altered your existence. And interestingly, when you talk about identity, how many people happily, powerfully tell us, I am a tubulite? Because they have taken that internally as their identity. Because they've been through this thing that just changed them. Whether it's a conference that they came to and there's, wow, dentistry is a positive environment or been through something and said, wow, I was anxious and now I love what I do. Going back to those two bits and people who've gone up that curve and ended up here and think there's serious value in this over and above just an online video library. That's what happens, they form an identity. But I tell you what then happens as well is they start forming the right environment. Because you cannot you know, um, express your true passion until you're in the right environment. And you then start really, it becomes a cycle of doing this. But really what I find most exciting is when all these things, all these ducks line up correctly and you're in the zone, as would say, 
passionate people end up in flow. Now, another good author is Mihai Chitsun Mihai. He's so good, he named himself twice. He's written one book called Creativity, and he's written another book called Flow. And his third book is kind of an abbreviated version of Finding Flow. What happens is we all have skills and knowledge, and we have a challenge, right? We're always faced with challenges. If your skills and knowledge are at a level where you can face that challenge, you just go in flow. If your skills and knowledge are lower and you can't face that challenge, then you get anxious. But if your skills and knowledge are so great, I'm an implant surgeon and you tell me to do something small and I get bored, that happens. So it's talking about flow where these things come. Now, passionate people, interestingly, start developing skills and knowledge that just raises the level of challenge each time. That's why they're always in flow. And that's what he was talking about as a, as, a, as a kind of nutshell. So they find that they end up in complete flow. And ultimately, that creates a whole different kind of emotional intensity within you. Now, emotion is an area I guess I want to look more into. So my next reading lists are all about that. But they get to this stage. And when you get to this stage, you're a whole different ballgame. You're no longer doing something because you have to do it. You're doing this. You, you basically don't wake up going to work. You, it's work that wakes you up to say, come on, we've got stuff to get done. You're internally driven. The fire is not being put up your bum by a manager. The fire is in your belly to get moving. That's what passionate people do. Now, what happens here is ha not everyone easily gets to this stage. To get to this stage, there's obviously a journey, there's a, there's a process, there's anything. And as humans, we are, 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 you know, we, we are biologically driven by nuance. So we are driven by, by new things. If you keep doing the same thing again and again and again, you get bored. You get bored. Some of, some of us are driven by nuance very quickly, you get bored very quickly. Some of us need to think of a new idea every 30 seconds. Some of us are driven by nuance a bit less quickly. But invariably, we are biologically wired to do this. That is why evolution is happening. Now, when we're biologically wired to look for nuance, to look for new stuff, we either do it because it's available, which is most people do it. We do it because Oh, I want to do something new. Oh yeah, there's a course here. I'll go on this course. Or you do it because there's a social influence around you. Oh yeah, I'll do this because my friends are doing it. Or you do it because you think I'm going to do something new and I know my value propositions and I'll do it. So you're kind of driven by finding something new that you believe in. And the big problem that happens, so, so when you talk about nuance, like I say, so you're either driven by the environmental bit, the social bit, or yourself, personal. And the big problem that happens is that most people work on this level because it's easier. They're looking for something new, but they don't know what to look for. What do I do? I turn to people around me. I turn to the environment around me because that means easy. Someone else makes a decision for me. In dentistry, this is a big challenge. A lot of people are kind of stuck in this negative rut of dentistry. A lot of people are stuck in, I don't know what to do. Oh, everyone's going on this person's course, I'll go on it because I think that might change my life. Or, oh, it's available up the road. Without stepping back and thinking, what is it that I value? What is it that I am sort of internally driven to do? What is it that will link me to my passion? Interestingly, over the last three months, I've had people coming back to me going, I either need to change direction, leave dentistry, and I take them through a whole process of discovery. And one person straight comes to my mind, has just recently invested thousands on courses on toothwear, composites, everything. We figured out this person has a whole different nuance and would benefit from courses on things like hypnosis, sedation, dealing with nervous patients, because they were doing new things, being influenced by social and environmental influences. Now you think about social media and how powerful that can be in moving your nuance angle 
to where it shouldn't be. But what happens is invariably, whatever way you do this, right, you end up going into an area where you select an activity, whatever activity it is, and you create an event in that activity. So let's, you know, let's say I'm going to select an activity where I'm new and I'm going to embark on starting to deal with patients who need facial aesthetics. And you then, one of the event is, I'm going to start doing a certain specific procedure. And when you do that procedure, you, or, or you do your event, or you do whatever it is, the activity, in life generally, you get an outcome. But that outcome is that. It's an outcome. It's not positive. It's not negative. It's an outcome. And anything we do, we are very quick at saying, oh, that was bad. That wasn't great. You've labeled that outcome already. You've immediately judged that, right? You've all done that. Do you know why that's an outcome and why you've judged it? Because there's a whole process on this side that the, this computer has done. You think that the latest 64 megabit RAM Mac or whatever is fast. This is fast. This is absolutely powerful. I'll tell you what happens, right? When this is happening, data is being input into your system. Where does data get input from? Your five senses. Eyes, ears, nose, mouth, touch. That's your data input senses. Right? Those five senses go in and put that data into, into your brain. Right? I'm just going to draw a silly picture of a brain. That's really crap. The African in me comes alive, right? My brain was born in Africa. But it, it, it kind of goes into the brain. So this outcome is nothing. But your five senses are taking this outcome in, sticking it into your brain. The brain is just an organ. The brain at work producing stuff is the mind. So the mind is actually the brain at work. And your thought is the outcome of what your mind just did. So your brain working produces thought. All right, make sense? Now, before anything, what we end up doing, and this is work by a guy called Albert Bandura, from a psychological viewpoint, you look at two things. One thing is called self-efficacy, which is you saying, am I going to be confident enough to do this? Right? It, he termed it the social cognitive theory, but basically, how much confidence, if I gave you some job, something to do, how confident are you that you will do it? How confident are you that you can achieve this? That's you thinking about your competence and confidence. And then, the other one is reflective efficacy to say, when you've done it, how sure are you? It'll be good. But they're both fairly good related. Now, what happens is your brain processes this stuff. And what is the outcome of your thought? What's the outcome of your thought? No. Emotion is the next step. But before emotion, what comes in? In your mind, you work out the consequence. Before you take action, you've already worked out the consequence. Is this going to be a bad consequence or not? And that's what partially then makes your emotion in action or inaction. Now I'm going to put something very interesting here because that thought immediately leads to consequence in your mind. And you're, oh Jesus, I can't spell now. Your consequence, you will either think it's negative or you'll think it's positive. Yeah? That is what will lead to emotion. The way you think is the way you feel is the way you lacked. So that's what happens across there. But something interesting. These five senses are taking in information. Where is that information? Or how is it going through into the brain? your nerves, your neural networks. When you're born, every newborn child 
has something like 250 billion neuronal networks in their system. Within the first six months, they get down to 10 billion because you don't use anything. So things, the influence, whether it's your society, whatever it is, whatever you're using is what will start working. Everything else withers away. And there's a, there's a phrase in neuroscience, nerves that fire together, wire together. So in essence, there's nerve networks that send this to the brain and these are happening all the time. Now you think about this, right? You do some activity again and again and again and again and again and again and again. Those nerve networks are firing again and again and again and again and again and again and again. And you're going through the same processing and same thought again and again and again and again and again. Does that make sense? What is memory? Memory is exactly that. It's remembering those same neuronal networks firing again and again and again. So if you do an activity multiple times, your processing will create memory. Now there are two things that can create that memory, right? What are you scared of? Snakes, spiders or cockroaches, Kala? Yeah. Me. That's a snake then. <laughs> no. Have you thought about this, right? I try and tell you about a desert. And I'm, you're walking through the desert. It's very cool. The weather's really nice. You got your water bottle. It's nice. Out of nowhere, from the sand, you see something move. This big snake just pops out. I just, and you think, whoa. And if someone's scared, I, I, there's no snake here, but you've got the mental vision in. And if someone's scared of snakes, that can create the emotion straight away, right? Mira, my wife, she's scared of spiders. All I've got to say is spider, and she goes like this. Think about this way, right? You have, a, you, you have an encounter with your mother-in-law and you just do not feel happy or comfortable. You think, I'm not having this again. The next time your wife says, mother-in-law, you don't need to see the mother-in-law. Just the thought of it freaks and gets you back into the same state of thought, right? What I'm saying is, if that memory gets really strong, if that memory, those nerves fire and they're so embedded in your system, that becomes your belief system. That's exactly what you believe in. And it's these belief systems within you because they've become part of you now. That they, these belief systems, that ultimately start determining your values. Because what a value is, is something that's important to you. Right? My value to help people is important to me because maybe what happened to me, I don't know. Your value to do something is important to you. And if it's important enough, you will do it no matter what. It's like those people who go and spend $700 on handbags um, by, I don't know, Michael Kaur or God, whatever. Yeah, those are cheap ones, right? 15 grand. But their bank account only has 14 grand in it. Why do they do that? It's a bit, for you, for me, for you, that's irrational. Why would you do that? But for them, that's rational because of this. They've had a value system built in through some memory, which has come through some experience. And ultimately, because of that, we are all driven by a certain value system that we don't know. And all our processing and all our thinking of consequences is happening because of that. Is it in conflict or in line with our value system? And that is where your passion ultimately lies. If you really want to define your passion, this is what you delve into, understanding it. The book by, oh, I forget his name, John something called The Values Factor, really worth a good read because it goes in and tells you all about values, discovering how you find your values, how you find somebody else's values, because that becomes very important. But here's the key. I was telling you this happens again and again and again and again. By the age of 35, you are programmed completely or mostly. That means I think most of us in this room are probably programmed already. You're okay, you've got a year. <laughs> but, now here's the thought process, right? I was telling you 
information goes through our senses. Two questions. Question one, how many bits of information in a day do you think we get in? In a day. In a day. Not in a second, in a day. In a day. How much in a second? Go on. You're not far off. You're not far off. Basically, Miai, Chits and Miai said 12 billion bits of information a day. Okay. Now, 12 billion bits. So if I, um, you know, if I use the word, that's one bit of information. A word is one bit. Uh, so if I say one bit of information, you've taken four. We've got 12 billion bits going in to our system every day. How much of those, what percentage of that is happening subconsciously without you realizing? 95, not far off, right? So this is so funny because 95% is going in without you realizing. You were in the train, you were in the car, you're looking at some billboard. You didn't even think you're reading that billboard, right? You're set on the chair right now, Ifti. Your bum is sitting, sitting and touching the chair. You didn't realize that just about. But when I pointed that out, now you realize the sensory information. That's information going in. So think about this supercomputer, how much processing it's doing. How much processing. And we live most of our life on autopilot, reacting to things. Completely reacting to things. We don't even realize this. And that's where I then come in to say there are two types of consequences here. One is negative positive, the other one is positive positive. A positive positive outcome is one that is in line with your values. But think about it, as humans we always want to feel good. So if you've got a negative outcome, you have to feel good. You have to make yourself feel better. What do you do? You become cynical. Dentistry, general dental counsel, nobody likes them. But they want to make themselves feel better about them. So you might have done something that isn't 100%, but you go, they don't know anything. Because when you say they don't know anything, bunch of idiots, ultimately you make yourself feel better. That gives you that dopamine boost. And what happens is you end up with this outcome, negative, positive. And if you think of that, how many people sit around there being cynical all day long? And now you listen to them and you think, <laughs> he's just trying to make himself feel better. Right, there's a negative outcome behind it. Let me poke that bear. You can do that. But this is what happens. Because of this, because of the thought that you've already had, you end up with what Jasmine said, an emotion. So your thought determines your emotion and your emotion determines your action. Let me give you two examples, right? We've got two business people, one and two, or anything. This guy's thinking, I want my business to succeed. I want to employ X staff. I want to make life brilliant for my customers. I want to make life brilliant for my users, whatever it is. He's thinking all the good stuff. This guy's thinking, Jesus, I need to survive. How the hell am I going to get through next day? I need to find a way. Oh, shit. My users are going away. Who do you think is going to be thinking better or different? Number one or two? One. One will be thinking more, what people say, positive thinking, right? And two will be thinking more survival. So he's more abundance, that's an abundance thinker, that's a survival thinker. But what happens is here, if you think positive, positive, your emotion is raised. You get the positive emotions. If you think negative, your negative emotions. Your body has various chemicals that kick in. The four good chemicals that we've known are dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin, endorphin. Right? Dopamine is a chemical that makes us feel good. Chocolate does it for us. Any kind of positive outcome will do dopamine great, even a negative positive, which is why the cynics are very good because they get their dopamine hits through cynical comments or whatever. Serotonin and oxytocin are the chemicals that are basically 
more to do with social. You get a rise in serotonin when you're around the same people. While oxytocin, you get a rise when you're around the same people and you suddenly get a position of power or influence. That's what drives humans for power. Because it's power and influence in that group. So this group trusts you. And that's where leadership comes in, everything like that. Leaders have a natural tendency for a higher level of oxytocin, interestingly. And obviously endorphins. Endorphins are pretty much, you go for a run, you've got so much pain, but this kicks in and makes you feel good. But on the other side, you've got cortisol and P3. The chemicals that induce stress in your system. And if you go back to one and two, one probably has more of the dopamines or the serotonins, two has more cortisol. And that now creates a whole different, con um, a whole different consequence, which I'll tell you what. So you get a thought, you get an emotion, and that's your act. The way you think is what your emotion does, is the way you act. Now if you're emotionally thinking like this, survival, what are you going to do? Act in a survival mode. You're going to close down. T-Rex comes and strands in front of you. You're not going to go, hi, nice T-Rex. Not that they exist, but you still think they exist. What you're going to go is survival mode. Your system shuts down. Your system is looking at the T-Rex, taking in sensory information. That thing is dangerous. Run. Your next part of your system is thinking all energy to my legs. And the next thing your sensory is looking at is there's a piece of rock there I can hide behind. That sort of approach. Immediately you're in that survival mode. Make sense? So you act survivally. All make sense so far? I'm on the last few bits really. But here's the bit. Humans, we have been wired for survival. We have been completely wired to look out for threats. And recent research is now showing that if something is in your genes, an activity or whatever is, is in your genes, then in essence, um, it's there for 14 generations. Epigenetics shows it. So if I have a fear in my genes, that fear can go through 14 generations. So some of my bits are, that's why we're wired for survival, because that survival, 14 generations means 14, 1500 years ago, whatever it is, 10, uh, 100,000 years ago, I don't know, um, there was that survival instinct, cavemen. Cavemen had to survive on two counts. They lived in caves, there were saber tooth, T-Rex, mammoths around, they had to look around, and they needed to hunt for food. We don't need to hunt for food anymore because food is readily available. We don't need to look out for T-Rex or Sabre, so what happens? We start looking out for danger every other time. Everything else becomes danger. A media news and sensationalization becomes danger. Um, someone posting, I've had a bad experience in dentistry, becomes danger. Suddenly those things that were not considered threats become big threats. And when our brain works, we have almost three kinds of brains, right? We've got the, the frontal lobe, the midbrain, and, and the hindbrain. And your hindbrain, which is the lower brain, is your automatic survival brain. It's a brain that doesn't think. Basically, T-Rex walks to you, you don't go, is this T-Rex? No, your sensor information comes in, it hits the frontal lobe, your visual cortices, everything talks to your hindbrain, says, danger, run. Hindbrain goes, right, fire the blood vessels, to the, uh, blood to the areas they need to, pump up the adrenaline, get this person out of here. It does it without you thinking. If I just went like this to you right now, would you think, oh, Drew's throwing a punch at me, would you do that? No, what you do is duck and probably fight back, or run, or freeze, right? That's our natural reaction, fight, uh, fight, flight, or freeze. There's one more, which I forget. There are four, actually, now they've come up with. But most of us, as a result of this, work in this process. We see a lot of information. We see it with the hindbrain, danger. And when you see it as danger, your consequence is negative. Your consequence being negative, 
it doesn't combine with your values, you go into negative emotion, cortisol, and you act in survival mode. And you do this all the time. And you keep doing this again and again and again, and before you know it, it's become embedded, because those neurons are firing every time, into your memory system. And your belief system is, I've got to survive. And that's where we're all messing up. Ultimately, the midbrain is the emotional brain, the limbic system, they call it. And the frontal lobe, which most of us don't use, is actually the best part of the brain, which is the highest point in evolution. And ultimately, this is where all this mindfulness, conscious thinking has come in. Because when you go into mindfulness, when you go into your silence, you stop taking sensory information. You're in your own zone now and you end up engaging your frontal lobe. And the more you do of that, the more powerful you get. Now there's another concept to introduce here is neuroplasticity. And neuroplasticity is very interesting. So I was telling you memory is built with all these neurons that are firing together, right? And these neurons that fire together obviously have synapses. And there's chemicals that fire between these synapses. You think of a mountain when it's brand new and water is falling in the mountain, the water just goes everywhere. And then slowly channels start forming. And that water finds it's easier to go through those channels. And it's easier and easier, and that's the river. Those are your neurons. It's easy for this water to fly through. That's what's happened to your body. That's why you've become so reactive to things. Neuroplasticity, before we used to think once your brain has formed, that's it nothing happens. Once your nerve networks are formed, that's it. But now we are re realizing the brain can change in chemical, in structure, in function. So if you had lots of synapses, let's assume these two nerve new networks were really firing away and you suddenly started changing the way you perceive things. As a result, changing the emotions, changing the actions. And you started firing this nerve more and more and more. Because the synaptic chemicals are limited in your body, this would wither away. That's the withering I talked about. Now, neuroplasticity is brilliant because it means you can start changing the way you wire yourself. You can start changing the way you think. You can start changing the way you completely react or act to things. And when you do that, this cycle changes. And then when you get a, a negative, a real negative outcome. Something that didn't go according to your values or your goals. Something that you did which was away from your goal system. You know what? It's not a negative outcome. It's a positive outcome because you make it, you change it into a learning experience. The phrase to use is, it's not a challenge um, in the way. It's a challenge on the way. And that challenge grows you. Now that is where you start pushing yourself and challenging yourself. Let me do it a bit more because if I get an outcome that doesn't go to plan, you may get a bit of cortisol, but that's good stress, good cortisol, because it'll still make you act in a positive manner. And that's how you then push the barriers. And that's where motivation happens, ultimately. Now you think about every day and everything going on. Like this morning as I was coming in here, the fast train, was lost and before I'd have gone, bloody useless London transport doing a strike, this, that. Today my thinking was, sort that, that means I've got 45 minutes to get a shit load of stuff done. I kind of sat there and did things and stopped it. You sit in traffic sometimes, late for work. If you let your stress kick in, you go, babe, babe, you bugger, get out of my way. You're suddenly in that survival mode. Now you think different, go, no, it's fine. What can I do to achieve my values, my goals, my passion? What can I do here in this point in time? You wake up from the moment you wake up, <coughs> your five senses are kicking in. The first, um, uh, uh, whatever it is, the first, I think, hour of the day, you actually end up taking one billion bits of information. So you do a lot more because your senses are heightened at that point for whatever reason. And your brain thinks, I've got to go to the shower, and your body follows you there. And you're all working in the same emotion, the same thought. Now, thoughts are hard to look at. Emotions are something we all can manage. 
and paying attention to your emotion every few moments suddenly tells you whether you're in that state or that state and you can alter yourself. Where does this work to motivate mindset passion? Not only just changing the way you perceive stuff, by the way, the brain, so from the eyes, there are 10 times more neurons going from the brain to the eyes than going the way back, i.e. the brain is telling the eyes what to look out for. 10 times more neurons. So that machine that looks like the African map there is a very powerful machine. And what you need to do with that machine is stop employing this and start employing this. And how you do that? For number one, find your values and your passion. Number two, rewire yourself, which means find the right network and be careful of the information going in in that area that takes me to social media and how many times do we scroll these timelines and we scroll these timelines and you think you've seen nothing your brain has taken everything in you think you've seen one post to get to that one post you've gone through four now if I tell you right now right don't think of a blue elephant just, no, don't think of a blue elephant. Please don't think of a blue elephant. Did you just not all think of a blue elephant? Now you end up in a social media group where every single person is going anonymous, I've got this problem. Anonymous, I've got this problem. Anonymous, I've got this problem. What's going to register here? The world is full of problems. That's not a support group anymore. That is not a support group, that is a group that is subconsciously putting you into survival mode and danger. What you need is a group that says, I have these many problems, but look at this positive that came out. I have this, look at this that came out. By the way, I've discovered my values today. Going back to a Congress, that's where the energy was because um, we changed the whole dynamic to say, let's convert ourselves to a positive atmosphere. There was some seriously good work coming out that actually has shown They've employed scientists, and this is where Jordan Spencer's work really impressed me. They're looking at electromagnetic radiation fields around people when they're carrying out these, these mindfulness exercises. And when people get into this stage where their frontal lobe is connected, they're in a positive, positive thinking, the magnetic field around them changes. So importantly, at the Congress, without you realizing, we were neuroplasticizing you. And it was, it was there, because that's where the energy was. But to me, positivity in dentistry has to come from the fact that we need to rediscover our values in the first place. We need to power that network in a fun, positive atmosphere. If we can create positive emotions, that will create positive thought. And fun always creates positive emotions, which is why those positive thoughts and vibes came across. Two big factors there. And if somebody ever now connects with me, this is what I do in the first instance. One, what are your values? Let's get you in that educational pathway. Two, what's your network? Because the right network does the right things for you. And then you start building a whole new memory process across there. What happens then is very interesting, and that's the last bit I'll go on. Because you continuously get the dopamine and serotonin hits, you get addicted to those things. So this activity, you start engaging more and more in it. So you engage in the activity, you do more, you spend more time, you get more competent, you get more confident, you do it again. You re-trigger the activity. So you re-trigger it, so you become competent, you become confident. And then you redo it. And then you do more of it, you grow. You go, let me build my challenge, let me push my barriers. And you re-engage in the event, and you end up with a positive outcome. And when you end up doing that more and more and more, guess what happens? You know your values, you know your goals, you know your network. You're now building the identity. So in essence, this is the way to motivate yourself. And when you motivate yourself correctly, you get into the grow cycle. And when you grow very well, you become passionate and that's how you thrive. Dental tubules, motivate, grow, thrive comes from there. And the key tools are why we're building a network with the right values and the right neuroplasticity. Because if we can do that, we can put positivity in dentistry. But you can employ a lot of these into your everyday living.
to get yourself differently because there is proven science behind these methods. And that is probably the summary of what I'll say. Thanks. Thank you. Any questions? Confusions? Correct, that's right. Part of it shuts it down. So I look at that as, as, as three layers, and as soon as H kicks in, two things happen. It shuts down F. Second thing is you go in survival mode. If I go in survival mode, I look after myself, and I forget everyone else around. And when you end up doing that, you don't end up damaging only yourself, you end up damaging everybody. So we have to keep that F alive, because that is a strength in community, and it's been shown enough times yeah. And, and the other thing about that with the, where the cortisol kicks in, and I've been doing some reading about stresses and things like that, and, and if you look at sort of our lives today, no, there aren't saber-toothed tigers and Tyrannosaurus rexes, but there are traffic jams and there are shitty bosses and yeah. things like that. They're still triggering the cortisol, but because of the environment that we live in, we're not able to run away. And running away releases those stress chemicals. Yes. We're stuck in the same thing. So those stress chemicals actually go through our bodies and go through our bodies and go through our bodies and we can't release them. And that's what leads to people having ulcers and burnouts and all of those kind of things because those chemicals don't have anywhere to go. And that's where it's about converting those chemicals to this. So one of my recent um, uh, work has been the word but, simple as. Now, now neuro-linguistic programming shows that if I say but in a sentence, it cancels out the first part of the sentence. So I use but and a positive. So for example, th this has been my work, and so I was saying with our practice owners group on tubules that our focus next year is on motivation of teams. And how do you get a team to work for you? Now just as a, as a small bit there to say, nobody works for you, everybody works for their values. And if their values align to yours, that's when things work. Now I'll use Kala as an example, and you don't mind, but Kala's biggest value is family, right? And doing that. And Tubules is a family. And that's why we work so well together. Ifti's biggest value is reading, knowledge, and gifts. And Tubules brings reading and knowledge. That's why we align together. Your biggest value is the fact that you like to share knowledge, the fact that you like to share stuff. That's why you align well, share, learn, connect. We've brought, I've brought your values, and I've actually aligned them to Tubules' values. So you're doing what you work with. Now, the reason I say this a step back is the word but, because but um, removes the first part of the sentence. So if you ever consciously catch yourself saying, oh, I'm pissed off, but finish it with a positive sentence. Automatically, your brain, you can't run away, but that's your runaway attitude. That's what I said this morning. I said, train's delayed, shitty, no, but I can do this. And immediately, pff, you've moved your cortisol away in your system. In the, in the smallest way. My boss on Wednesday went, the same thing, I was talking about this motivating teams and I've done all this. He just went, motivating teams, just hire the right people. That's it, done. And I went, I work for you. I know how you hire the people, right? I know your business again. But I couldn't say all that, but it kind of pissed me off a little bit. And then I went, but I've got a brilliant opportunity now to neuroplasticize this guy. So it kind of went, <laughs> felt good in myself in a way. Um, but yeah, that, this is it. Because you can't run away, you've got to find runaway mechanisms. And our runaway mechanism is a but. Also, starting your day, when you start your day, what do you look at your phone? Do you do that? Do you start your day and look at your phone? No, good. We all do this. What does that do? It fires known neuronal networks in your system. As soon as you see my message, you don't just see my message, you see me. You see the idiot that I am. You see the bits I might have done. All these little things happen. That's why at the first hour of the day, we, we fire more bits of information. Because not just the information, it's everything else that goes in. What you need to do is instead, for the first 20 minutes of your day, look at nothing and figure out your values and your goals and just vision on your goals. Because what you end up doing Everything else shuts down and you create those neuronal networks, you create those emotional chemicals, 
And those are the emotional chemicals then that you maintain through the day. And then you see something negative on any post, you go, forget this, boom, you switch it off because you've so addicted to these higher level chemicals in your system, why do you want shitty chemicals? And that's what changes everything. But you can't do that but unless you know your values and your passion. So values become the core of things from there. Yeah. Lots of good thinking in that. My next step is going to be all about studying emotions, understanding there are seven types of emotions, what triggers that. Because emotions are the, the kind of voice of the body. While the thoughts are the mind, you can't always read the mind. But you can read your emotions and that feeds back. The problem is you get negative emotions, it leads to negative thought, leads to negative emotions. Boom, 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 you're in a vicious cycle there. You have to break that. And it's interesting when you take it a step further, and you know, some of the stuff that I've read, uh, one of my favorite expressions is that we don't live, we live in the feeling of our thinking, not in the feeling of what's going on in the world around us. So you're driving along in the car and someone cuts in front of you. It's not the fact that they cut in front of you that pisses you off. It's how you think about it that triggers the emotion, which yeah. is exactly that cycle. Yeah. So the next time you're in a discussion with your partner, Here's, here's something to look at, right? You talk about that. <coughs> Not the feeling of your... Here's, here's something to think, right? Okay, look around the room. Look around the room everywhere and find all the blue stuff you can see. Yeah, yeah everything else scribbled on the board. So all the blue stuff you can see, right? Okay, close your eyes. Now just try and remember all the brown stuff you saw. Now open your eyes and see how much brown stuff you probably missed out. Because your brain was telling your eyes to look for something and this is the feeling. Yeah. So everything starts here and it's engaging that in the right way and plasticizing that with the right people. That's where that phrase you become far, what, like the 5% of people you hang out with comes from. Um, and, and that's where leadership well, comes from. I can't remember where it was, and I saw something, and it was a, a film. Oh, I know where, yeah, I remember where it was. It was like a film of a bunch of different people in a room doing different things. I and mean, the guy said, now I want you to watch out for this particular activity. So we've got 15, 20 people in a room. And you're watching for this activity and watching for this activity. And then someone dressed as a gorilla walks into yeah. the middle of the room, spins around, and then walks off. And in a group of 100 people, how many people saw the gorilla? Two or three. Two or three. Have you, you've seen that video, haven't you? The basketball yeah. one. Yeah, that's the one. So, well, there we go. why? Because your, new, your memory was already programmed to look for something. It's a programming is powerful stuff. You can preempt people. You can really preempt patients. Um, and an example is how many of you get your patients in yourself? Right, so I'll tell you this one is, uh, you know, uh, when I go in and say, Dr. Uh, Mr. Kara, would you like to come in? Was your journey okay getting here? I don't ask you how was your journey, I go, was your journey okay getting here? Would you like to sit down? They're all yes, no questions, and whether you answer me or not, in your brain you're going, yeah, no, yeah, no. Would you like me to make me a blank check, please? Yeah. If you've worked that, but what you're doing is shutting that down to exactly that, looking for something. So it's not just telling people, you can program them to do the same thing. David, where was your last holiday? Where was mine? The last holiday? Canada. When's your next one? Uh, I don't have a book yet. <gasps> okay. Where are you thinking of going? Canada, definitely back to Canada. Were well, you thinking about your holiday in the Scandinavian country? Yes. But I was asking him about his last holiday. Why were you thinking? <laughs> do you see what I mean? It's, so I could be talking to one person, but you're programming everyone. And then you use this yes, no, and you do this. And this is what you're doing behind this. Exactly what you said. You're focusing. So when this person is telling you, look out for those basketball players, you went, I'm looking out for those. And, and that's what it, and then you went, I'm looking at the basketball players. When I told him holiday, you would start looking at holiday. That's the programming that bloody advertising societies are doing around us all day long. You know, the subtle marketing and stuff. Anyway, brilliant. So yeah, that's where I'll finish. Okay. Thank you. It's your is it you next, Jasmine? <laughs>